Collies, hot spurs, welcome back. Talking Tottenham every week, no better place to be sat. If it's a win, lose, draw, we'll be here for a chat. Best believe we tackle topics like Romero in the back. Young Min Son, what can go wrong when he's on form? It's a dream come true, so sit back, relax and back. Hello and welcome to another episode of Holly Hot Spurs Live, where tonight we've got a 3-1 win to dissect against Forest. And with me to do so, I am joined by two fabulous guests at the moment, but Jay will be on his way. So first of all, Ben, it's amazing to have you back on the show. How are you, my friend? I'm very good, thank you, mate. I'm very good. Always good to be chatting after a win and a fairly decent win as well. Wasn't perfect, not spectacular, but um, lots of positives to take from it. So yeah, I'm, uh, it's good to be back on. Amazing stuff. I'm also joined by Patrick. Patrick's amazing to have you on again. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Ben. Great to be on it with you as well. So yeah, like Ben hey, said, you too, mate. You, you know, it's a, it was a game of um of moments, and um, all in all, a good game. You know, decent win. Got some pluses on the goal difference as well. So yeah, let's let's chop it up. Let's talk about it. Happy days. Now, Jay will be joining in a minute. So when he joins, I will drag him in and he can say his hellos. But welcome to everybody that's in the chat already. Good evening. Hope you're well. But let's get on with it. Because obviously, Ben, I'm going to start with you first. Obviously, we wanted a win. We needed a bit of a bounce back, obviously, after that draw. Um, and going into this game, how did you kind of feel this one setting out, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's a tricky one, especially like we were sort of talking about before we came on about the sort of reaction of the fan base after every result at the moment. So it kind of always leaves you with a weird feeling kind of going into these games that you should you should win. Um, and we got the job done. I think it was always going to be about that. Like Forrest were never going to make it easy. They're always going to pose a threat on the break like they did. I think they've scored more goals from counter-attacks than any other team in the league. So there was always like some of the insecurities that we've got as a side at the moment, one being set pieces and one kind of being our inability to defend transitions a lot of the time. It was... It was always going to be a bit nervy, but I think I think there were enough positives to take out of that West Ham result that you could take into this game that would make you feel confident of getting the win. So I felt fine. I, I felt I felt fine going into it. I thought we'd win fairly comfortably. I actually did predict three one before the game, so I was quite quite happy with that. I got some of the scorers wrong, but um, you take those. But uh, yeah, I didn't feel I didn't feel too bad going into it at all. No, and I think that's the thing, you know, the fact that we actually went through and did the business. Obviously, it took a little bit of time to get there, but it did happen. Uh, yeah. Jay is here as well, so welcome, Jay. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm I'm, I'm tardy. I'm I'm always I'm always. I, I thought I was going to be on time for a change, but then uh, famous last words. But thank you for having my debut. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you, Ben Patrick. Always nice a pleasure. Always, always, always. Yes, Jay. What's good? Yeah. What's good? Good to catch up, man. Good to catch Excellent. up. And indeed, over a win as well. And Patrick, I'll come to you now. And obviously, obviously, Ben's mentioned the fact that he's going to this game. It was probably one that we should be capable of winning. And obviously, when the game started, how are you kind of feeling? Because for me, my biggest pet peeve for Spurs is the fact that we don't have shots. And I thought early on in the game against Boris, we were having those kind of shots. Yeah, like Ben, I went into this game confident. I know right now, you know, it's squeaky bum time and... Every team in the league essentially has got something to play for. Forest fighting for their lives. We knew they was going to make it difficult. But I went in confident. I thought it would be a 3 nil or a 4 nil. I was hoping for a clean sheet. But annoyed when they scored literally against the run of play. Like out of nothing. And out of nowhere. And like you said, we started quite brightly. Biss had a few shots, a few cracks on goal early doors. So I was like, OK, cool. Because we've been quite reluctant to pull the trigger in in um, recent games. And it's almost like we're trying to score the perfect goal and walk the ball in. Sometimes have a crack. If you've got a free, you know, if you've got a free shot and they're backing off you, take it. Like even when Hoiberg came on, I like the fact that he was wasn't afraid to shoot if he was given the space and the time to be allowed to do so. So we started well, um, you know, and then obviously we had our shakes and wobbles, which you'll probably talk about. But all in all, it was a bright, positive start. I went into the game confident, and yeah, we kind of came out of the it's weird. We always have a bit of a lull in the first half. Sometimes we don't actually play at all in the first 45. I thought we did well for the first 20. And in the second 25 minutes, we literally, once they scored, they were essentially the better team in moments, which was a bit, a bit worrying. But yeah, all in all, a good start to the game. And um, obviously, we'll talk about the rest as you go along. And that's the thing. I think, like you said, it's, it's really strange with Spurs at the minute in terms of we either start really good and then there's a blip or we don't start at all and then we all come out guns blazing in the second half. But Jay, for you, how was your kind of all in all in that game? What was your kind of takeaways to start with? So, like, just just as, just as a positioning thing for people that have never heard me, I'm I'm quite positive. I'm like, I'm like on the positive side of Spurs Twitter. Um, and uh, so I have a logic when I go into these games is that 
Um, there's very few teams in the Premier League who are good enough to control a game for 90 minutes. So whenever I'm watching Spurs, I don't, I, I'm never as critical as other people because I always assume that you're going to have periods in a game that you're going to be under pressure. So I thought I'd check the stats before the game and I was like, oh, actually, like uh, Forest in terms of XG, they're just behind us um, in the table in terms of XG conceded in 2024. So immediately I was like, okay, so Nuno's got them pretty well set up. Uh, they have a good level of intensity. So I was like, oh, this is the game that we've been, we struggled in all year. All, all year, the, this team, mid-low block, good aggression, good intensity, yeah, good players on the counter. So I never thought this game was going to be simple or just straightforward. I thought, okay, I was the most annoyed that we conceded uh, a fairly sloppy goal because the reason I was annoyed was because I was like, you're idiots because you've done all the hard work to get in front. And now you've just given a goal, and now now we're back where we started for no reason. So that's 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 where I saw it. But in general, I thought Forest are a decent side. Um, we're a good side, and we're good enough to to broadly control a game and take our moments. Um, and, and I think this was one of those games. It's quite similar in the general play to the, a Brentford game or an Everton at home or a Brighton game. It's just the quality differential was better than in certain games then. Their defensive positioning was better or worse. Same against Palace. Differing levels of control and differing levels of players taking responsibility. The game becomes easier or more difficult for me, depending on how much the players take responsibility. In certain games, they take a lot of responsibility and these moments become easier. Werner taking on his man at every turn. You know, like um, when you have that, the, the game becomes a little bit easier. So in general, going into the game, I wasn't I wasn't like, oh my God, we're going to lose. But I was like, yeah, this is going to be a, this is going to be a, a hard four win. Like that's, that's how I was thinking. I didn't think we were going to bottle it or anything, but I was just like, it's not going to be as simple and then the narrative when you go into a game thinking it's going to be simple you're going to be more critical of the team because you believe that the team should be wiping these guys why are you not just smashing these guys out of the park and then you're going to be like this player is bad and that player is bad not taking into account hey you know these defenders at forest are in form hey gibbs white alanga hudson adoy against a team that's you, you playing one on one with these players on the counter, so yeah, like I was, I was, I was happy with the win, broadly happy with how we played. Wasn't overly concerned going into the game. Wasn't overly concerned throughout the match anyway. I love that. I need to have you on every week, Jamie. In positivity, <laughs> but you're right in the sense that we did the hard bit first, and then that was scored. And obviously, that was through Werner. And it was a little bit of luck, but again, he put the ball in the right place. What did you kind of make of Werner in, in the game and all? See, I think that's. So, I think, so I was going to say, that's such a good point about Werner because I think that it's one of those goals where if if that's Sonny or Johnson who are coming in at the back post to slide that into the back of the net, I think we're talking about that as a really well-crafted kind of typical Ange ball goal. But it always looks that little bit more ugly when it's a defender putting it into their own net. But it was a lovely kind of little interchange between Basuma and Son. I thought for those that first 15 minutes, I thought Basuma dictated the game really, really well. I thought he built on the performance that he had against West Ham after a couple of uh, poorer ones but it was kind of my disappointment in the way he faded faded out of the game after that but then again that was kind of typical of a lot of the players on the pitch as well and like Jay said it was kind of disappointing to do the hard work to get in front then for that to sort of fade away um, it wasn't the sort of typical Spurs first half that we've seen in in recent weeks of going behind so it's encouraging to take the lead and like I said I thought it was a really really well well put together goal I think what I like about Werner is that his desire to consistently go out the fullback and get himself in the and get himself in that position it's almost like fullbacks maybe underestimate him sometimes because he found himself in that quite a lot of space down there to be able to put that ball in I like how comfortable he is to deliver on his left foot as well makes him that little bit more unpredictable sometimes he does like to come into a, on his right but I think we saw it in the Luton game last week how he will get his head down and go down that channel and keep cutting the ball back with his left foot it makes him that little bit harder to defend against and I think to an extent with the with the fan base I think Werner has almost suffered from the preconception of him he's sort of perceived like failure at Chelsea and all that kind of stuff. And I think that is baggage that he's kind of got to carry, but I think he's done really well 
to sort of offset that quite a lot. I've been really impressed with him. I think you have to take that all away from it. And if you judge him based on individual performances, if we'd have signed another winger on loan in January that wasn't Timo Werner, say, for example, last year, where we signed Dan Juma, if Dan Juma had the same impact that Werner has from the start, because it's a bit more of a sexy, kind of more exciting name of someone that doesn't come with that baggage like Werner has, I think people are instantly saying we should definitely sign him. Like we, it makes so much sense. And I'm, I'm in the camp that I think it's a bit, a bit of a bargain at 15 million. And again, that kind of raises eyebrows from people who are like, well, doesn't that show a lack of ambition? It's like, not for me, not at all for me, because nobody who's saying that we should sign Werner is saying that we should sign Werner to be that starting left winger. He is the best starting left winger we have available now, especially with Richardson's absence, which means that Sonny has to play through the middle. He has he is one hundred percent the best option that we've got, fit or not fit within the squad. For me, people talk about Solomon and all those kind of things, but I think for how effective Werner is and how well he plays with Johnson as well. One critic of mine with Werner, and to be fair, I don't think we saw it a lot as in this game, but we certainly did against West Ham. Is where he does all the hard work on his side to lay the ball to be able to provide for Johnson. But when Johnson does that same work on the right hand side, Werner doesn't make that those same runs to the front post as Johnson does, and again. We nearly saw that goal to make it 2-0. And if um, with Johnson right in front of the keeper, Sells makes a good save. Johnson couldn't have done much more. But again, it's Werner creating that threat down that left-hand side. There was another peach of a ball that he put into the box in the second half, which went right across the face of goal, which again could go in off a defender, could go in Johnson coming in at the back post or the front post or whoever it is, or Porro arriving. Um, so I've been, I've been impressed with him. I really have. And I was impressed with the goal as well. I think that was the best we'd started in a good while, to be fair. We controlled that game really nicely, pulled them apart, like you both kind of alluded to earlier on as well, taking pop shots from outside the box, just looking a little bit more confident. I think we started that game with a little bit of swagger, which is why it was disappointing to for what happened next to, to happen. But again, in the grand scheme of things, we got the result in the end. But I thought it was a really encouraging start. And I, th I think Werner, for me, is a bit of a no-brainer. I really do. Mm. And I think this is the thing. I think, obviously, there's talk about whether we sign him in a permanent deal uh, in the summer, Patrick. But I think, for me, the, the fact that he's had this initial impact, obviously, I've written down some stats, forgive me if they're wrong, but it's two goals and three assists with 11 appearances. I don't think that's too bad coming into a side in January and trying to mould into this Tottenham side. Is it for, Yeah, no, it is three assists, isn't it? Because he got an assist in the last game. That 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 assist yesterday... I know they count. Yeah, it doesn't count, does it? They yeah. count it on fantasy. Football. I count. It counts to me. It counts. No, it does. Yeah. If if he forces the the defender to make an error, as in our own that's goal, an assist. Yeah, that's an assist. an assist, man. An assist. Is I think it is when you set up your teammate to score. Like, so don't, don't get me wrong. He he did like you said, Ben. He did all the brilliant work. He put that ball in that danger zone where defenders mm. don't know what to do. You you have to make a play. You either have to clear it or get. You know, you have to swipe at it. If not. There's someone usually on a back stick to poke it, poke it home. So he did brilliantly, but it's not an assist because he didn't pass the ball to a teammate who then scores. So I don't know. It depends how generous you want to be, but it was brilliant of him to do it. And, you know, it's fantastic. It's a goal for Tottenham either way. So it, it does it really matter? No, but does it go down as an assist in my books? No, it doesn't. But he's, um, the thing is I'm on the fence and I even said it off screen before we started. I, I don't, I don't mind Werner. I think he's been okay in certain games. In other games, he's been frustrating. For 15 million, is it a no-brainer? Yes. But will it, if it takes away from us potentially buying bigger and better, then for me, it's a problem. But if it's squad depth, then fantastic. We're going to be in a lot of cups and competitions next year, ideally Champions League, plus deeper cup runs. So having someone like Werner playing, coming off the bench or starting in games like he's doing, is brilliant, but I do want better quality than Werner as well in the summer. But I mean, for what he's done so far, I can't really complain. Sometimes he's frustrating, but all players are frustrating. Son frustrates me at times. Brennan Johnson frustrates me at times. So does Madison. So does Kudaseski or whoever you want to name. They all frustrate us, but they're still top players. But we always demand and expect more because you know we know what they're capable of. But all in all, so far, he's been OK, man. So I don't really get it. Some fans are like all the way this way, all the way that way. I'm kind of trying to be balanced and sit in the middle. If he has a good game like he did yesterday, you applaud him. If he's frustrating, you don't think he's had a good game, then fair enough, you can say that. But you don't need to be toxic. You don't need to be negative. You don't need to, every time we don't have a result go our way, blame it on Timo Werner, like he's the only player that's not playing well. It's a bit crazy. Some of our fans are just mental, like... You know, we win 3-1 and there's still people complaining. And I'm like, we're fourth right now. Mm. You know, our goal difference is decent. We're in a decent vein of form considering. You know, we go into a tough run of fixtures. But 
Like some of the guys just don't want to get behind the team, which is insane. You know, considering where we were last year and where we are now, there is considerable improvement. Of course, we can be better. We can stop conceding sloppy goals. We can stop having these lapses or, you know, after Forrest scored, they were actually the better team for the for the next 10 or 15 minutes, which was concerning for me because they well, started we popping the we ball. We can't discuss no, that. they were, Jade. They, we could have uh, been yeah. We were yeah, gun, 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 yeah gun to head, I can co-sign that. But, you know, gun to head. Do you know what nah, I mean? Nah, not gun to head. We were chasing shadows after they scored. Like, I was like, wow, what's going on? Literally, the, the game transformed. But luckily, we, we, we rode through that storm. Mm -hmm. And then second half, uh, Ange, credit to him, made some big changes, some big calls. Um, they tried to force him after the game. I found it funny because obviously I was at the stadium watching the game and then I came home. As soon as I come home, I I ran straight to the like the post-match analyst or like the, where they dissect it. And they almost like they were forcing him out. And why did you make the changes? Was there injuries? He goes, no, I just made changes. I just felt that I needed to. So I thought I was really brave of him to do that. And credit to Hoiberg and Ben Tanker, they came in and just dictated and showed up that middle. And we just looked so much more like together basically after they came on and yeah after that it was kind of plain sailing second half it was comfortable wasn't it yeah. it really was and I think that's the thing obviously like we said it was frustrating Jay that we conceded obviously that goal in that nature and the likes of Adogi kind of switching off the Suma kind of switching off mm -hmm. for you was it just that lapse in concentration and this will happen with this Tottenham side because I think we all forget they are quite young these yeah. players in this team and it will take time for them to understand Ange because I think a lot of us kind of forget We've only just really started this journey with Ange Postecoglou and served the players. So, for you, do you think it's a worry to, to worry the fact that we're conceding this many also, amount wait, of goals? Let me, let, I'll, let, two things. One, I want to do that. Quickly on Werner. Um, so, with Timo, it's like, he reminds me of Martinelli, like our, our little version of Martinelli. Like, how, how he, you know what I mean? Like how he, how he plays and stuff. And <clears throat> the thing about players is that Premier League is a first impression league. I've always known this about this Premier League. You come into the Premier League, you dazzle in your first five games. You can dine out on that for the next eighteen months. Like you, you can, you can be. I remember, I remember Mudrick came on, did a couple turns against Milner, and for like four months, I was like, oh, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy could be it for Chelsea. This, this oh my God, what, what? We so the thing about Werner is, when I look at what he does, the thing is to me, he's brave. Yeah. yeah, and bravery in football is rare because our fan base are assholes. And mm -hmm. the thing about when you perform in front of assholes is that it can be difficult when you make a mistake because they're ready to boo you again. But this guy just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. I like that. It's a good characteristic. When I look at some of his misses, I'll be like, yeah, he's missing. But when we play Brian Gill, he doesn't get those chances. When we play other players in that position, they do not get those chances. So that's an interesting thing for his movement, for his understanding of the system, for his his ability to make himself subservient for the team. As in, like he's putting himself at he's there for the team at the team's behest. No, low ego. So with someone like that, yeah, you you want you want that kind of person in your squad. You want that personality profile in your squad. You don't need them to start, but you're saying if you're building a squad, that's a piece. And that piece will come good for you across a 38 game. So if you rely on that piece too much, you're not going to get out what you want because you're going to have an over expectation of what you're getting from that piece. But if you're utilizing it as a piece, there's value there. And, and I think for me, uh, yeah, you know, Good player. He's a good player. You can see he's a good player. Now, is he as good at certain things that you want him to be? He's he's clearly never going to have elite ball striking. So if you need an elite ball striker, you are not getting that from Timo. So if you are, if that's what you want and you expect from your winger, you are constantly going to be like this guy's shit. Every time you're going to be like this guy because you expect something that he doesn't have. Now, in terms of the defense and and the consequential thinking. So I remember when I was little, yeah, my mom used to say to me, you lack consequential thinking. Yeah. And first of all, I was like, first of all, I'm a child mom. Like, what, what, what's all this? What, what's, what's all this? What's all this? <laughs> but, but deep down, I, I, I took that lesson with me. And the lesson is, is, is that you have to, sometimes you, you, can, you can just be scared of what's going to happen. 
And for a defender, having that fear of if I don't do X, then Y might happen is a really good trait to have. Too many of our players lack in-game intelligence, like real-time game intelligence, and also they lack the ability of consequential thinking. They they let someone run off them and they're not thinking, oh my God, like if this guy gets the ball, we're in big trouble. They're just letting the guy run off him. And then when that moment comes a second or two later, it's too late. So the, the question is, do these players, yeah, like do these players have it in them to have these characteristics that are necessary to play in the system or do they need to be replaced? You have to give them time to adapt and understand. But some of the mistakes, some of the running off, some of the, it's not to me a concern yet, but it raises questions. I'm looking at these players and I'm like, some of you, is this your ceiling? Is, is this your ceiling of ability in this side? Yeah. And if so, some of you can't be starters. So I mean, so that's why I'm like, Udogi, he's a baby. Yeah, so I'll let him off. But Bizuma, no, you're 27. You you have we we let you off last year. So now I'm saying to you, say, okay, at what point do we hold him accountable and say, you're not you're not good enough for what we need to achieve here? And and that's why I look at the, the mistakes and the goal. It's I can forgive an Udoji, yeah. I can't forgive our starting six at 27 years old, who's meant to be a mature player, these mistakes. And that's that's my issue with these players. It might be a bit hypocritical to be holding different players to different standards, but that's where I'm at. No, and you make such a valid point because I don't think that he's really put too many feet wrong. And like you say, he is still so young, but Basuma, I mean, Ben... Obviously, we saw at halftime that uh, Ange made the decision to bring, obviously, Saar and Basuma off. And for me, it was almost like they were both kind of in the same sort of regions on the pitch. And obviously, at the start of the season, we were kind of thinking what our three would be in midfield. And you would predominantly say Basuma and Saar and, and someone else. But right now, it clearly isn't Basuma being the man. It's like Jay said too many times that we've kind of let him off the hook, but really he should be pulling his weight now. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's honestly bizarre. Like, you look at that West Ham game on Tuesday. I said it after the game. It's almost like he seems to raise it against a higher level of opposition, which is great. And we've seen great performances from him against Arsenal, against Manchester United, so dominant in that midfield in those two games at the start of the season. And obviously, we were riding a wave at that point, but we were genuinely incredibly impressive, and as was he. But I've just seen it too many times now where against, no disrespect to Forrest, because I actually thought Basuma started the game pretty well. Like I said, driving forward with the ball, that nice little link-up play with with Sonny to open up the pitch for the goal. He wanted the ball a lot and he wasn't shying away from anything. But when it comes to that defensive discipline, that's really what he's lacking at the moment, especially at home against these smaller teams. Again, no disrespect meant to them, but it's almost like it's a lapse in concentration, which like Jay says, it's like you have to be held accountable for that. And especially when you see someone like Hoybier who's waiting in the wings. Now, I know Hoybier is incredibly Marmite. Like he, Some fans love him, some fans don't. But he came on and showed you the discipline that is kind of required for that level of performance. He had a shaky moment towards the end of the game. And it's not a Hoybier performance if he doesn't look erratic in possession and nearly gives the ball away for us to score. But what he does for the rest of the game, was what he did for the rest of the second half was incredibly impressive in terms of the way he didn't take too long on the ball, knitted everything together really nicely. I don't know. I just can't put my finger on what it is with Basuma. And it's so disappointing because it, we've seen the window into how good he can be. And like Jay says, he's, I, I he's 27 years old. I have a theory for you in a second. So, so my thing, so I run a recruitment company, yeah? So I talk to hundreds of people, thousands of people. Man. So I like to think I'm a good judge of character, right? So there's certain people that if you give them the best conditions, they, they're going to be a great performer. But they need to have the best conditions. With someone like Bazuma. Yeah, it reminds me of most people in life and society is that sometimes we just don't fancy it enough. Mm. Yeah, sometimes we're just not that asked. We're not that bothered. And at elite Premier League level, yeah, I remember hearing him talk sometimes about his ability 
and how good he thinks he is. Yeah. And I get that. And I I and I, I saw at the beginning of the season when somebody applies themselves to the fullest potential and concentrates their absolute arse off, that's what Bazuma can do. That's his level when everything's perfect. But the problem is whenever any little thing happens, the level drops, the level drops. He gets inside his head, the level drops. He's too, he, he's too emotive. Like he's, his emotional intelligence isn't high enough for, for like, he gets distracted. He gets this, he gets. So to me, it's like, it's not that he's bad or this or that, but you're, we're asking at the highest level of football to be a starter for a team that's a top three or four team in the league. There's no embarrassment with not being of that level of a player. Yeah. Do you, I think see, that's, yeah, that, do you know what I mean? That's what, that's yeah. what comes down to me. Like, maybe he's just not, this level of player yeah, yeah i get that I, I completely agree like and that's why like you said he it's kind of what i was saying as well like he wants to in these bigger games he does raise it because the stakes are higher and he, he understands that but it is a lack of concentration in these fixtures that don't necessarily in his mind define tottenham season as much even though they do you know we we won that game yesterday and that's put us in an amazing position for champions league football but maybe with him on the pitch, we don't have that quite same intensity in the second half to get us over the line. And I think with Hoybier, again, he does stuff in games which can cost Tottenham big time in the sense that it's poor decision making, maybe at the wrong times or looking a bit too erratic when he's got men around him. But what you're always going to get from Hoybier is the opposite of what you just said about Basuma. Like he understand, he has that maturity and that level. Like he's a full international for Denmark. He's shown that level of consistency for them throughout all these years. And I know that he's not the sexiest player in the world. And Basuma, we've seen can be that. Like well, there's no, it's a bit like you know, like we used to talk about Dembele. Like there's no better players maybe to watch than someone like Basuma when he's out on his day because he makes it look so so easy and he doesn't have to think about it and he does go into kind of autopilot in a way and that can be so so dangerous but I don't think players like Hoybier and Bentoncourt especially don't allow themselves to ever get into that state on the football pitch in these games in the league and that's why like you're looking ahead to the weekend where I know Newcastle are a little bit decimated at the moment but you're looking at someone like Hoybier thinking and, and looking beyond that as well for the Arsenal game and I know I said Basuma raises it in those games but you need him at that peak level of emotional maturity in a North London derby because we've seen he can let us down throughout the course of the season with the a couple of red cards, the dive, etc., things like that. Just maybe having that too too much of an arrogance. And maybe against Arsenal, it won't be a problem. Like I said, he does tend to raise it. But mm. it's difficult to go into those games with that in the back of your mind because yeah. he's, he can be such an important player for us. But, you know... Four, four or five months ago, we wouldn't be sitting here or, you know, I'm sure you guys have had conversations on like the last few, you know, kind of editions of this around, maybe, do we need to look at number six in the summer? Do we need to sign a six? We weren't having that conversation in September, October. Like, and it's got to that point now where you can, it, it's all well and good being that level of player on your day. But if you're going to, if you're going to make those mistakes and have that lack of discipline, well, like th that's part of the reason we've conceded so many goals in transition because, Basuma's just not... It, like, Luton was the perfect example. He well, With the Andros Townsend thing, he catches up to Townsend because Townsend doesn't really break out of first gear. He gets to him, covers the ground, but then just gets done so, so easily and leaves that defence so exposed. And it's just... Those things are unacceptable at, at this level, um, especially for a player who's shown the highs that he can. So it's a, it's a real frustration. But again, credit to Ange for kind of recognising that and having the having the bollocks really to, and he's done it with Madison plenty of times as well, yeah. even though Madison, you, I don't think maybe, I think you can level similar things to uh, that to Madison as well in terms of maybe emotional maturity in some moments. Not well, hey, hey, hey. Yates well, incident. Listen, I, I don't even, I don't even, listen, I, I don't want to get into Madison's emotional maturity because <laughs> we're talking about a guy, yeah? Like there's too, there's too many examples. Like I'm, I'm trying to ignore them. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I don't tweet about them, and so, but people will catch on eventually because it's like I remember when he scored against Villa, the first thing he wanted to do was go the opposition. Yeah, he wanted to do his dart celebrate, and then he remembered, oh, hold on, let me celebrate with my teammates first. Let me, let me, let me show some appreciation. But his natural instinct was to go and go with the opposition. Yeah, you saw how rattled he got with Mope. 
Why is Mope wrestling you like that? What, what is going on? You, yeah. you see at the weekend, he punches Yates. He could easily have got a red card, ruined our game. Mm. Why? What? Like, you told me you were mature. They told me you had a kid. They told me yeah. all of a sudden, no, 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 they told me this stuff was behind him. And, and I'm seeing evidence that potentially it is not because it's starting to, I'm starting to see one, two, three, four examples. What great player, but even Ange is starting to see it now. I, th- yeah. I feel you, he's, people are forgetting he's one of the captains. There's three captains. He's the only captain that keeps getting subbed off. Yeah. Do you think the Yates thing? I think the Yates thing is so over exaggerated, though. Okay, it's okay, okay. Fun. It was, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And so should, should, day, should, should, should our vice captain be punching somebody in the stomach? Uh, well, at the end of the day, if the, if Yates is going at him all day and nibbling at him and this and that, you know, you're, you're within your rights to stand your ground. And he literally shoved him away and Yates went down and pretended he was injured and all of this. Nonsense. It was a little, you, yeah. you know, it's a yeah. little, it's a little, little dick. It's a little, a little <laughs> dick, but I think if it's though. not. I think if it's not Ryan Yates, I think Spurs fans are making more of it because Ryan oh, Yates yeah. was a nightmare in that first fixture. Exactly. Where exactly. it's almost like funny to do it because it's Ryan Yates and everyone, all the Spurs fans hate him. And, you know, he was constantly, you know, again, he was at it again during this game. He got books, could have easily been potentially sent, yeah, sent yeah. off for like, and yeah, exactly. Like, he's not the flavour of the month. But if, that, he, if he does that to maybe Gibbs White or does that to another player, I think Spurs fans are saying what are you doing? Like, you, there's yeah. just no need, there's no need to do that. But yeah, it's, I, I think Andrew showed that he's not scared to take Madison off to try and make, uh, impact the game. And I, I love that about Andrew. We all love Madison. We all recognise it. And, and rival fans might look at it and think, well, he's one of your best players from the outside looking in. And he has yeah. been great for us this season, but I love the fact that he does that to try new things. It's all, the most important thing is the system rather than the, the elements that kind of make it up. And the fact that we have got that depth available on the bench now, we've seen like the last two or three games, that's been the strongest bench we've arguably ever had as a football club. Mm. And we've got the depth to change it up. So if that means that one of your best players has to be sacrificed or one of yours perceived best players, that's that's okay. I'm 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 more than calm with that. I'm more than fine. I, 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 I like the, I like Madison's edge. By the way, there's something that um there's a play you were talking about. Zuma. Yeah, sorry, we were talking. He's lost his edge. He's yeah. lost his unicycle. You know, it's like when Deli Ali swore and and then he got banned and stuff. He lost his edge. I remember pinpointing that exact moment when Delhi lost his edge because he he when you overstep the mark, it can be difficult to work out where the boundary exists again. You, you're recalibrating for yourself. So Bizuma has overstepped the mark with his reds. He's overstepped the mark with that. You know that. So now it's a case of when when should I dribble? When 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 should I when should I stick my foot in? Should I should I, should I take a book in? Should yeah. I not be taking bookings? I don't want to give away a reputation as someone who's constantly getting booked and red carded. Maybe I shouldn't make that tackle. Maybe, maybe I don't want to give a foul away here because if they go, you get inside your head. And yeah. the thing is, is I like players to play on instinct. So with Madison, that my critique is not, he's a bit of a wide boy. You know, he's a, he's a bit like, nah, 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 nah. Be you, be you. Like, that's why we brought you here. You know, yeah, exactly. that's, that's why people were like, oh, Madison or Ericsson after 10 games. <laughs> Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, oh, you Gaza, and all that sort of good stuff. That's what happens with stars because now they're building over that. Oh, Madison, no, no, he's he's still the guy from Leicester who would go missing for a couple of months a season. He's still that guy, and he needs to show us that that he is irreplaceable in this side. I remember seeing other playmakers at other sides. It's not linear, you know what I mean? It's a bit of a bit of a downturn is good for a player, you know, like like let 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 the comeback be begin and all that sort of good stuff. So I'm not hating on him, but I'm saying like I'm I'm seeing petulance. I'm yeah. see I'm seeing stuff that if Bruno Fernandez did, people would be like, oh my god, Bruno. I'm looking at him on a pitch, I'm looking at the arms going up, I'm looking at the, his frustration. It's starting to, to to be visible, yeah. and he just needs to dial it down a notch or two because he's it's coming to the place where he's he's getting to the point where he's almost berating his teammates when they don't pass to him, and that he's he's to me aesthetically he's looking kind of Bruno Fernandezy at the moment. That's that's that. He's, you know <laughs> he's what I mean? Like that. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's coming across that. a bit of a Portugueser. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. I can see I- it. 
I get that. I do get that. And it's a little bit frustrating in the moment. Like to, uh, It's been a bit of a bugmare of mine, Like especially since he's come back from injury. I think one th- maybe it's because he's trying a little bit too hard, but I feel like the importance... It, I might be totally wrong, but my perception of it is that it's all about the aesthetic with Madison. Like yeah. I think sometimes it's yeah. too much about making the pass look good, making this look good, making that extra touch because it's just that little bit more, I don't know, like that little bit more sexy. It's just like, mm-hmm. it's just, he's, and that's why he's just not being quite as effective, I think, at the moment. But again, like you said, I think sometimes these players need that little bit of that downturn to then be able to rise back up again. We've seen it with other, it's not, you know, I'm not, so, I, I don't, I wouldn't put him in the same bracket as Odegaard in terms, in terms of personality, but people yeah. used to level that a lot at Odegaard last season when it's like in those bigger yeah. games, you go missing all that kind of stuff. But he's come back this season and shown that that is not the case. So mm-hmm. sometimes these kind of maverick style players, which you kind of alluded to there about the conversations around Gaza and is he better than Ericsson? You want Madison to be that maverick, but you also want him to have that greater emotional maturity to understand that he is just a cog in this system and he's not hes not the guy. There is no guy at Tottenham anymore. We haven't got Harry Kane. Sonny is the club captain and club legend and he deserves to be held up on that pedestal, but there's no guy at Spurs anymore. This is a team. This is a system. Like... That's what I think he maybe needs to get that understanding back. Every word that comes out of Madison's mouth, like in interviews and stuff, is great. Like yeah. you latch onto the words that he says. He's talking about falling to fight for Champions League football. He loves being here, all those kind of things. But I want to see that. I want to see that on the pitch now. Mm. Um, I know you mentioned sexy and I want to move on to obviously the goal because uh, Patrick, <laughs> my man, daddy long legs as I like to call him, Mickey Lansier, <laughs> scored an oh, absolute God. whiz bomber. Uh, so Patrick, <laughs> I'm going to let you do the honours and walk us through that goal because it was incredible. Yeah, no, it was incredible. And the funny thing is Son had the ball and he was kind of like, you didn't know what Son was going to do. He was um and ah, in and pass it. He laid it off and Mickey just ran onto it one touch and bang, keep had no chance to just straight into that top corner as a rocket and he struck it with a plum and yeah it was brilliant man and then the way he shook off cootie as well he started celebrating and yeah love that he, yeah he literally jived one way and went the other and yeah, yeah. it's brilliant man. <laughs> and um because we sit in the south stand i'm in block 254 so the great thing is we saw two fantastic goals in the second half we saw the pedro power goal and then we saw the obviously saw the mickey van der ven goal first sorry then pedro powers and both defenders just striking the ball so cleanly and keeper no chance and it was great and yeah first home goal because he scored at Luton away but he scores big goals in big games and I thought he was easily the best player on the pitch yesterday so um at the game when I saw the updates coming through from the Premier League app it said Sonny man of the match and I was like huh as much as I love Son I was like no chance and then when I got home and I turned on like I said Sky Sports and around it back they gave it to Mickey so I was like yeah that makes more sense because Mickey was just brilliant, man. The, the way he was just marshalling the defence and, you know, he is a cheat code. The way we play, you need a Mickey van der Ven in your team. Someone that can just sweep up and mop up, even if a player's quick and they've got the step on him. He's just so clean. And, I mean, he's a brilliant passer as well. People don't really talk about it, but I think he's got the best passing accuracy in, in um, the Premier League this year. He's clean on the ball, keeps it simple, keeps it ticking, isn't afraid to push the ball up. The guy can do it all, man. He's a he's a brilliant player. Such a it's such a smart signer. You know, we talk about recruitment and you know, there were so many names and defenders that were heralded before him. And he's come in and been one of the best defenders in the league comfortably. It's just a shame he had the long layoff because if he didn't, imagine where he would be as well. Because he's had two injuries as, on top of that. And he just come in and it looks like he's not been out. You know, we talk about Madison coming back and finding form. We talk about this guy having to... Mickey's just come in and just hit the ground running. Like, you, you forget he's been injured. Big injuries yeah. as well. I think the guy's fantastic, man. You just hope and pray that, you know, he doesn't suffer any lung injuries and all of that stuff. But as it stands, it looks like he could be... You don't want to go crazy and too far ahead, but I think he's got all the attributes to be a, a, a brilliant player, man. Honestly, he looks so good and so composed. And everything he does, he just does it. It's like silky smooth, isn't it? He's a Rolls Royce. He's just such a good player. I mean, our, yeah. record, God, sorry, I just, no, our record with him in the team is insane as well, by the way. I think he started 20 Premier League games. 
Um, and we've only lost one in which he's completed the full 90 minutes, which was the Wolves game where we were missing both of our fullbacks. So it's like, yeah, it, it, he's he's such an important player for us. And like, like Patrick said, he just slotted straight back in. No problems. Mm. And I think that's the thing. Like, obviously, we talk. He's a big player because he is very tall. Um, and the <laughs> fact, like you said, he just slots into this team no, no matter what. It's like he's been here for years, but he hasn't. I mean, Jay, I know I'm not one for out there takes, but I know Jeremy Redknapp said something along the lines that Mickey van der Ven. I disagree. Sorry, I, 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 I don't know what the take is, but I, I, I just, I just know I don't want to sit on the same side as Jamie Redknapp on history. So <laughs> that is like, true. You know what I mean? like just, that balance, that balance of probability. Sorry, sorry, go on. That's all right. It's fine. It's just saying that he could potentially be what uh, Van Dyke was at Liverpool, but for Tottenham, if that makes sense. See, no. Now, the reason I say no is because, like, for me, I, I, when I look at Van der Ven and Romero, they're like. They're like a remix version of uh, Toby and Jan, like do you know what I mean? Like updated for it's like it's it's what it's like Wild Thoughts versus Maria Maria. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's the way we 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 upgraded it. Um, and no, so the thing from a, from from my point of view, from a player profiling point of view, Van Dyke is more like a Romero, like as in stylistically, he's more like a Romero. What he can do, like Van der Ven, still lacks the ability to pass like Romero, the, the ability to break lines consistently, you know, do that. He he progresses the ball kind of more like dribbling, which is which is fine. You know, no issue with that. But you with a with a he's the cover defender rather than the go to the man and get tight defender because we need his pace. So it's very difficult for you to be that defender and then be the Van Dyke because the Van Dyke is the more controlling defender. He's the the point defender, the guy who dictates a little bit more. So at this moment in time in his career, he there's attributes he's lacking, which is fine when you have a partner like a Romero. Do you know what I mean? So the thing is, is that a partnership, it's a like partnership. So if you want to develop attributes of being the dominant player in the partnership, like that, that, that's a skill set development point of view. And that's not to say, I don't know what the hell Van Dyke looked like at, at 21, 22, 23. I can't remember. I think he was at Celtic. I don't remember thinking, oh, but I remember he had his passing. He, he still was kind of dominant. He was still like a dictator. So to me, um, I haven't quite seen that yet from Mickey, but still, he's a baby. Plenty of years for, to develop that. But because he's that's not his natural thing, um, He's not shown me that he's a natural defender yet. And, and I know that sound, might sound a bit harsh, but it's like Romero's a defender. Like, do you know what I mean? He's he's a defender. You know, when he defends, it's like he defends like a defender, like the way he tackles, the way he goes, the way he reads the game. That's slightly different from Mickey. Mickey is somebody who can defend, but we use his, his pace to cover. So there's slide tackles and recovery tackles sprints into the channels it's almost like you're the secondary defender not the primary defender but you've got a lot of attributes that could make you the primary defender but you don't do that role yet so in summary yes could potentially reach that level but if you're the if you're the main man in modern football and you're the person that that's where the level of difference is and and yeah, so I think I think he's got the potential to achieve whatever he wants to achieve in football. But I'm just from a profile point of view, the Salibas and the Van Dykes to me have a slightly different profile to what Mickey's got at the moment. And um, so that's why I don't know if he can hit a Van Dyke level because his skill set is is subtly different. Maybe in ability, but not in terms of how he's gonna play. No, I'm with you. And that does make sense, like you say. It, it, I mean, it was Jamie Redknapp that said it, so <laughs> that might be why. Exactly. I didn't hear the quote, and I see, exactly, I knew he was wrong. <laughs> uh, but no, as we know, Mickey van der Ven as well. I big him up all the time now that I lost my winksy. So, uh, Mickey van der Ven's the new winks that hopefully I won't jinx this time. But then, obviously, we managed to win the game, and it kind of leads us on uh, to Newcastle. Not forgetting, obviously, Pedro Porro's strike as well, which is incredible. But I want to move on to Newcastle. Um, and Obviously, that being said, as we know, every game at the minute is very, very important. So how do you see this one kind of going down? I think this is a really tough one to predict, not even just to sit on the fence, because you don't know what Newcastle side are going to turn up at the moment. You saw a Newcastle team that were 
pulled apart really by West Ham, who didn't cause us too many problems. But then they go back and win that game 4-3. And yeah, the catalyst for that was a pretty dodgy penalty that got that momentum going again and two moments of individual quality from Harvey Barnes. So they have got they have got the uh, the kind of the assets to hurt Tottenham for sure, especially, you know, leaving space in behind. Isaac and Barnes will kind of feed off on that. Gordon as well. It's a, it's a kind of a Malfour in front three that they can put together at times, which is kind of... But I know they've had a lot of injuries which have made it a turbulent season, but, you know, with that quality, it's a bit baffling how they have been that inconsistent. But again, that's largely down to the injuries. But again, it makes it a harder game to kind of predict. I do worry about the threat of... Isaac as well. Obviously, we're going with kind of battle scars there from last season. And although Spurs are in a completely different place, you still think Newcastle on their day can can hurt Tottenham. A lot of their game is kind of on the transition. Clever balls in behind to those wingers running in behind. It's going to be, it's not going to be an easy one for Tottenham. But then again, I think Newcastle again showed in that home game against West Ham. They do leave themselves incredibly vulnerable. They just haven't got when they've got their full team out on the pitch. They have got the quality to go toe to toe with a lot of teams, as shown by the fact they got into the Champions League. Last year, the Champions League has kind of derailed their season this year. And I love the fact that Ange used that example of Newcastle when he was consistently getting questioned about the Champions League. And it shows that no matter how much money you've got, it's not always going to it's not always going to equate to success. And look at Newcastle, for example. And, you know, they have had a turbulent season, but it, that doesn't make it any, that any easier. We've kind of struggled there of late recently, last season being the, you know, the peak of those struggles, which was, I think, a game where we all probably turned off after the first 20 minutes. Um, but even before that, it's never been that easy place to go. Even if we've won, we've always kind of made it a little bit, a little bit difficult. So yeah, I it's it'll be a it's an incredibly interesting one. I, I have confidence that we can come away with a win. I think again, I wouldn't go with too many changes. I think if you're going to change an area on that pitch, I think you're looking at that midfield. Uh, because they have got that dominant aggressor in in Gimaras. And I think that maybe Basuma, again, kind of coming back to full circle, what we were saying earlier about stepping up in these big moments that really matter. And on the surface, on on very basic level, Newcastle against Tottenham is a big game, even though every single game, whether it's Burnley, Sheffield United or Arsenal in this running, is of kind of equal importance. But where it's on a basic level, just because it's a bigger team, you he might tend to, he might step up and raise his game. But I think when you're looking at the performances of Hoybier and Bentoncourt, in that second half, I think it's hard to ignore because of the maturity and the composure they brought to that midfield, which we're going to need on Saturday. I think with Benton Core as well, like you can see that he's playing his way back to that level. I think the last couple of performances, there was a few shaky moments against West Ham, maybe giving sort of blind balls away where he's just played it kind of on instinct and all of a sudden it's ended up at a West Ham player's feet. But the way that he knitted that kind of play together for a lot of that uh, West Ham game, it kind of gives you that attacking threat as well alongside Madison. They can sort of play more as two advanced eights. I love the fact that Bentancourt was driving into the box with the ball that he was doing a lot last season under Conte as well, being that real kind of carrier in that midfield. Um, and yeah, I, I, it'd be a really interesting game. I'm confident that we can come away with a win, but it's just, it's one of the, in this run-in, like there are a few games that are kind of like black and white. In the like the Chelsea game, we always tend to struggle. Liverpool, we always tend to struggle. Arsenal, we know will be tough because at this moment, sadly, they are the best team in the league. And Man City, slightly, again, we've got the one over them a little bit, but again, you have to, you, how good a side they are. Whereas Newcastle, I just think is, out of all of these games, I think actually the hardest to predict, I think. So, yeah, I'm going up to the game on Saturday. So hopefully it's a worthy trip. <laughs> leaving <laughs> uh, leaving on, uh, in the early hours of the morning. But uh, yeah, I'm confident. I'm confident. You have to, we've, we know what we can, we know what we are, we know what we can be. Yeah. So you've got to be confident going into these mm. games, I think. And that's the thing, Patrick. Obviously, I think that midfield is probably going to be the big game changer. What are you kind of saying? Are you, are you saying kind of like Ben? Maybe you start Hoiberg and Benzikor, or do you start with the same squad that started against uh, the previous game? I don't know. It's such a hard call, isn't it? Because, like, on their day, all of them are brilliant. But push comes to shove, going off what I saw, I'd probably start Hoiberg and Benzikor. And then if it doesn't work, you can still change it up. There's no, you know, and I think even at halftime, Andrew would have said to them, listen, guys, nothing against you. We've got a lot of tough games coming up. You know, just chill out and be ready for the next one. So whoever starts, it's not like you're getting dropped. You're literally getting rotated. But it's a tough one because I've seen Hoiberg look brilliant and um, he pretty much got everything right, apart from at the end where he got pressed and he kind of just ran out of ideas and gave the ball up. But other than that, he was excellent. But... Newcastle away is a different kettle of fish. And like Ben said, they have got pace and physicality and power in that middle three. Um, so you may, but then if Ben Tanker's on the ball, he's silky and smooth enough to break presses and break lines of his dribbling and passing ability. 
and so is Kuti Romero when he pushes up. And Jay Anudipu, Kuti can break lines with his passing as well. So it's a tough one. I think whoever starts, hopefully, you know, is up for it. As long as they're up for it. And Newcastle away is a tricky one. You know, if push comes to shove, I will back us for the win. But I think as long as we don't lose that game, I think we'll be all right. You know, some games, some some grounds you go to, like when we drew with West Ham away, I was like, you know what, I'm frustrated we didn't win it, especially your doji last, literally last shot of the game could have won it. But I saw what it was. West Ham are a tough team to break down and beat. You take a draw. I'll take a draw at Newcastle. But obviously, you know, we want to push and get all three points. But as long as we don't lose that game, I'll, I'll be happy with the result. And um, we've got more than enough. We just need to be careful because, unfortunately, we do concede chances and we do concede sloppy goals. Newcastle, obviously, are much better than Forest, so we just don't need to allow them back into the game. Yeah. But they'll know that we've got more than enough going the other way to hurt them as well. So it's a it's a really tough one to call. I can't call it, but I don't think we lose. That's all I say. Fingers crossed. And like you said, to, to take a point when we're away from home, I think it's a half-12 kickoff as well, and Joey we bloody yeah. love them, don't we? So how do you kind of see this one going down? Um, so Newcastle, one of these, it's like, because I, I basically had a, a nice back and forth with Newcastle fans in the in the summer because uh, I had this, uh, I was on a show and uh, I was talking to a Newcastle fan and, and basically they, they were quite confident. And this, I think, I, I don't, I think we, I think we basically just signed Madison and Vicario at the time. And I basically told the Newcastle, I said, there's, there's no way you're finishing above us next season. No, zero. Yeah, like record. And they clipped it and they put, I remember people at the time were laughing at me. They said, oh, look at this guy. What makes Tottenham fan? And so this is the thing with Newcastle. Um, they are a good side. They've had, I mean, aside from the fact, you know, they signed a gambling addict and, and you know, they've had a lot of injuries and stuff like this. It's, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's, the, that's the one where it's like, I, I blame Tenali. People are like, worst signings of the season. Tenali captain. Do you know what I mean? Like, as if everyone else has had like other factors, but Tonali, that's that's all you. Like, you know, that's just that's just this guy just like like liking Paddy Power too much. Like, it is what it is. And Newcastle is a game and a team that is it falls into the you know when we played United, didn't really know what we were gonna get. I didn't really know if we were gonna win or lose. When we went away to Villa, didn't really know if we were gonna win or lose. When we went to Arsenal, didn't really know if we were going to win or lose. Do you know what I mean? Like, all of these games, basically, bring me a top 10 side away. I I know we're probably going to turn up, but I can't tell you what the result's going to be. <laughs> but if but if we if we play to our capacity, we'll win. And we have to start looking at this, this in, in the context of the team that we're playing. You know, I saw them... Um, is it that they beat 4 3 the other day? Um, West Ham. West Ham. So West Ham went there and scored um, three goals. Do you know what I mean? So we should be looking and saying, okay, we're going there to score two goals, like at least, like make sure we score at least two goals. And then you say to yourself, is if you go to Newcastle and score two goals, that should be enough to win the game. So, so to me, when I start breaking it down, I'm like, Okay, they've got players that can hurt us, but they're only going to hurt you if you don't do your job. Do your job, they won't hurt you. Yeah? Play the game in Newcastle's half. Yeah? Okay, it's scary on the counter, but it's scary on the counter if you give the ball away in the middle of the pitch and they start attacking you. That, that you know, that's why it's scary. Think I watched City, I was watching City the other day and I would see City and then all their players would be in the opposition half and they'd be rotating the ball. And I'd be like, these guys play just like us. They literally do everything that we do. The only difference is they don't have incompetent brain farts at random moments, yeah, which cause them to look at the city when they played us and Rodri had a brain fart on the edge of the box and Hoiberg won the ball. Did we not score? Straight away, we scored. The problem is, is we, we, we have too many brain farts for the system we play. That's all it is. It's, it's as simple as that. It's just reduce that. When we played West Ham, very low mistake threshold. Big mistake was, you can argue, the break that Antonio had and the set piece that we conceded from. That's it. In the whole 90 minutes, that's it. 
Yeah, I was like, oh, Bowen, Paqueta, Kudus, Antonio. Nothing. They did nothing. We controlled them. Yeah. So, so the idea, the idea for me here is, is that we can obviously be got at, but mitigate the opportunity for the opposition to get at you by making intelligent decisions. Be brave. Don't be scared, but don't be stupid. Being brave and being stupid, do you know what I mean? The two cheeks are the same ass. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just like I want you to make it clap, but in but in the right way. That's <laughs> Jay, honestly, the, the, the one liners you've come out with tonight, Jesus Christ, I can make like a whole show just of them. Um, but like you say, hopefully we don't have too many brain parts and we do and go and do them at Newcastle because, again, it puts some great stead going uh, forward into the next lot of fixtures. But it's been amazing to dissect, obviously, uh, the Forest game and look ahead to the Newcastle game. So we'll go around the table and we'll say our goodbyes. So, Ben, thank you again so much for coming on tonight. Where can everybody find you? No, thank you, Holly. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed it tonight. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, just Ben Bowman, and on TikTok, where I do most of my stuff as well. And hopefully YouTube coming soon as well, so keep an eye for that. But yeah, nice one for having me on. I appreciate it. Lovely stuff. I look forward to the YouTube, Ben. That should be really good. Uh, but thank, thank you, you again. And also, Patrick's been amazing having you on as well. Where can everybody find you doing your Yeah, thing? thank you, Holly. It's been a pleasure with Ben and Jay, of course. And um, yeah, I'm Patrick Tyrant. So Patrick and then oh, T-Y-R-E-B. Yeah. 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 And that's on that's on Twitter and um, Instagram, and then also um, on YouTube, Patrick Tyrant as well. Just type it in, um, and you'll find me and see all my content on there. Yeah, lovely stuff, love it. Uh, and also, Jay, it's been amazing having you on. Like I Thank say, you. those wine liners will live forever. Oh, uh, they're, no, the they're, they're they're powered by Chat GPT. Um, <laughs> I just, I just, I just, I just was like. Um, witty, witty Tottenham orientated one liners. Um, you guys can use that as a prompt if you, if, if you want. Uh, so, but no, thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Like, um, you, like I've, I've been on Patrick before, but Ben, the first time I've, I've, I've had a chance to speak to you. Loads of great points, like, very enjoyable. Um, you, you, you all seem like nice people. Don't, don't let, don't let right side Twitter Tottenham fans find you. <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, hey. We're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's been amazing, Jay. Where can everybody find you? Uh, on uh, so it's on Twitter, Jay Radar. I, I keep on talking about like I'm, I've started a show. It's called the Team Sheet. Um, and by started, I mean loosely started, <laughs> as in like the name and the Twitter handle. But you guys make this whole content creation look so simple, you know. Yeah. And then I start trying to do it. I'm like, oh my god, this is hard. This, is, you know, <laughs> you need to run things and organize things. And yeah. oh, oh, gosh, so so at the moment, you're gonna find me moonlighting on different shows like this, where people um people foolishly foolishly give me the time to come onto the show and, <laughs> and talk on them, which I will always appreciate. But Twitter J Radar in the meantime. Lovely stuff. Amazing things. And thank you to everybody uh, that's in the chat now that's going to rewatch this. Really do appreciate it. Like I say, Hotspur Huddle will be back Wednesday while where Wes will get out the tactics board and do all the good stuff. And then Holly Hotspur's Live will be back next Monday, same time, same place. But until next time, come on you